Thank you for having me. This is something that, as Rob said, I have spent a lot of time on recently, and it's something I've become very passionate about because I think there is a fundamental blind spot in the blue team and, to be honest, the red team operations. Yeah. Now, you all know that we have a credential problem, right? Am I seeing heads bobbing out there in the, in the, in the sea of lights? But the goal today is to convince you that the problem is way worse than you probably think. Yeah. And hopefully provide some gleam of, uh, of light at the end of the tunnel that maybe we can aim towards uh, in our operations. All right, so the key here to re remember is that everything in Windows is tied to an account, or near everything. Knowing that, the entire attack cycle really revolves around these accounts. They actually become a very interesting funnel for us. We know that the attackers are going to have to very early in an attack do something related to credentials. I can't even really think of a large-scale attack that can be done without credentials. They're just critical to every stage as we go through. And so if we look at an attack cycle, you know, of course we get that first foothold. So we get that person that comes in, they get that, they click the link, they do a strategic web compromise, whatever it is, they've got a spot on the network. Very shortly thereafter, the attackers are gonna have to get access to credentials. They're almost never going to have exactly what they need to accomplish their goals. So they're gonna dump credentials, and then they're gonna use those credentials to start moving around the environment. And everywhere they move around the environment, they're gonna dump more credentials. Right? Because they're going to have to build out a portfolio of credentials in order to get around the segmentation or get around to the locations that, that will allow them to finally accomplish their goals, uh, which is eventually gonna be achieving complete domain dominance, and then finally, the rape and pillage of the network. So knowing this, you know, well, well, the bad news is the number of credentials that we're going to see is astonishingly large. But the good news is that we know they're heading that way. And so we've got these very kind of, kind of binary places where we can identify activity. Now the other key thing about some of these credentials we'll talk about today is that uh, unfortunately some of them may persist even after remediation. And this is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, is that you're successful, you finish your intrusion, you high five, you go home and see your family for the first time in weeks. And there could be still credentials out there that should they get that initial foothold again, instantly give them access back to domain admin and, and dominance of the environment. And so that's what we'll talk about today, is this idea of the attack cycle and what credentials are gonna be part of that. So, this tweet makes me so happy and so sad at the same time. The, uh, <laughs> the happiness is, first of all, I'm just so glad to be on the blue team. I don't know if we have any red teamers in here, no offense, but you have the most boring job on earth, right? This is your life, right? Imagine if every investigation, you knew exactly how it was gonna end up. We are making it far too easy for attackers. It's literally a 140 character pen test report which is also what makes me really sad about this because um, I wish I could report, write reports you know, in Twitter format. All right, so what credentials are we dealing with? Right? We know the attackers are gonna have to eventually get to that domain dominance. What is the path they're going to take? So let's do a little quiz to wake you guys up. Uh, we're gonna go through some credentials relatively fast. And if it's something that you think you could describe to a friend, I want you to elbow your neighbor that's probably hung over and asleep right now and let them know how smart you are. So we've got these just ridiculous number of credentials. And, and really what I think of when, when we go through this is the level of complexity of the credentialing in Windows really is, is working to our disadvantage. Half the time we don't even know what we can or what we should be protecting, let alone how to actually protect it. And this list is by far not exhaustive. It's just getting more and more complicated as we get to the, the newer uh, versions of, of the OSs. And uh, as attackers are showing us the error of our ways and finding new ways to, to attack uh, all these various credentials out there. So we obviously don't have time to go through all of those. That's, uh, that's homework. Uh, but we do need to talk about a few of these so we can kind of understand where Microsoft has been going with, with some of the, the new uh, mitigations that, that have been coming up. And so, uh, as Rob mentioned, hashes. Right? Uh, not the most exciting of topics. You've probably all known about the uh, hashes and credentials uh, forever. But the idea of a hash, of course, is a representation of the password uh, in, uh, in Windows. This is the MD4 algorithm. And 
if you get the proper hash in a, in a domain, you pretty much can unlock any piece of information in that domain you need. You just have to find the right hash to get there. Now the hash is, in general, you've heard of hash dumping, so if we can dump the hashes off the system, we may be able to then take those and crack them. And so the old school method was this idea of rainbow tables or even brute force cracking. If you're lucky enough and the password is not complex enough, you get the clear text password. And then the cool kids started to do something called pass the hash, which undoubtedly most of you heard of. This is the idea of now I no longer need to actually crack, crack the hash. Now I can just reuse the hash. Uh, not a bug, it's a feature within Windows. It allows things like single sign-on. And so multiple tools came out. Windows Credential Editor, you see on the bottom, what was one of them uh, that, that really started taking advantage of past the hash. We'll see some examples of Mimi Cats, which undoubtedly many of you have heard. Uh, but the idea here is that we can take these hashes and start to use them now through the environment. And so as an example, uh, GSEC dump, very common dumping tool. Uh, and you can see it's relatively simple to run. Now, one thing to keep in mind with hashes, if it's a local account, hashes are in the registry. If it is a domain account, the hashes are in Active Directory. The only time those hashes will be present on a system is during an interactive session with that system. When a user logs out, those hashes aren't present anymore, at least not on the more modern OSs. And so we do something like GSEC dump on a system like this, and we see a ridiculous number of hashes. Right? So basically, these are all nicely formatted, just ready for cracking or, or reuse in a, in a pass the hash attack. And the reason why we're seeing so many in this particular example is this was actually on a domain controller. So typically, you'd run this on, say, a workstation. It would only be whatever active sessions are on that system. Um, but this is exactly why sometimes you will see on your domain controllers attackers taking the really dangerous step of running something like GSEC dump because the risk and reward benefit here is great. And so we've got all these active sessions on the main controller. They pretty much can pick and choose uh, whatever they like. And I'll also say here, I'm listing all the tools as we go through a few of these, largely because I want you to go home and play with them. If you have not done credential dumping, you, know, you haven't lived, right? <laughs> so live. And also, to be honest, uh, as I was going through all this, I was actually quite surprised that many of the, the standard tools that have been around forever uh, are actually starting to be less reliable. Uh, if you've noticed in some of your investigations that you're seeing attackers come in and maybe dropping, maybe you're finding even three or four different credential dumping tools in the environment during the attack, it could be because what we're seeing in the more modern versions of the OS, some of these tools are simply failing. Good news from our standpoint, uh, but if you look back at the revisions, we've got like FG dump and GSEC dump. Some of these tools haven't been updated for years. Uh, and so they're starting to kind of show their age. And so one of the best ways to learn about this is go to some test systems, run some of these tools, see how they work, see what the output looks like. All right, so once we get the hash, a uh, simple pass the hash attack we see here. Uh, the way pass the hash works is uh, you can't do everything with a pass the hash attack, but you can certainly do things like SMB authentication, so you can map shares, you can do things like PS exec, so you can remotely execute things, uh, you can even interact with things like WMI, which gives you quite a bit of power. And so this is Mimi Cats, and what we're doing here is basically taking a hash that we dumped from anywhere, using that to run PS exec, and then you can see that we've got a session here on the bottom, which is now a command prompt on a remote system with that new hash level of privileges. In this case, it was a domain admin account. So super easy. Uh, Mimikatz was, uh, I think, one of the, the big watershed events in the credential world. It's what finally woke up Microsoft that, hey, we've got a serious problem here and we better start doing something about it. All right, hashes, easy. Tokens is really why I started to dig into this. Uh, what I realized talking with folks is that there was a uh, very, very low number of people that actually had a good understanding of tokens. Uh, if you're on the red team, you are abusing tokens consistently, but most people can't even tell you what, what they are or why they exist. Um, and so uh, think of a hash as this is the authentication, right? So a hash gets me in the door, the token is going to give me an idea of what privileges I have after I've authenticated. And these tokens are everywhere. Every process run by that user will have a token associated with that user. Right? This is how things like Word. So you run Word on the system, and Word 
you open up a document through that application, well, Word needs to know, well, where you're allowed to access in the file system and where you're not, right? Word has no idea. It's the token that's running or part of that process now that identifies kind of where you can access in that environment. Even worse than that are something called delegate tokens. Now take that, and now a delegate token allows you to essentially extend your privileges over the network. And these are actually the very dangerous ones. These are the ones that are commonly abused uh, in attack scenarios. So all you have to do is go forward and find a running process that a user account of interest runs. If you have a privilege called the SE impersonate privilege, right, which is basically admin has this privilege by default, you can then steal that token and you can reuse it wherever you like through the environment. Now, it's even better than a pass the hash attack, largely because, to be honest, uh, where we're headed here is Microsoft is going to close the door on pass the hash. They're consistently knocking the legs out from under that attack. Uh, I would say very, very soon here, we're gonna start seeing pass the hash largely deprecated. Right? But token stealing and token use is going to continue on uh, for the indefinite future. Um, so, I've got a token I can now authenticate as your account, or if it's a delegate token, anywhere in the environment. And I can do things even better than pass the hash, which is totally relied on NTLM authentication. I can do things like run basically any uh, built-in Windows tool as well as your user account. And so I can do things now like create new user accounts that I want or you know, run any other kind of tool like PowerShell as your uh, level of privilege. The other key thing and reason why we see token stealing very often is that uh, Microsoft is headed down the path of actually protecting LSAS in a, in a much more robust way. We'll see like protected processes coming up in Windows 8. We'll see credential guard. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Well, those are going to remove the ability to just attack LSAS and pull the hashes out. Uh, the great thing about token stealing is we never have to go to LSAS. But I can go to any process and just yank that token. All right, so lots of tools can do this. Here's an example of, of Mimikatz. Uh, Mimikatz uh, makes this dead simple. You're on a system. Basically, you can go forward. In this case, I just said, who am I? It said I'm a standard user account. You go element domain admin, or elevate domain admin in Mimikatz, and it will go search through kind of all the available tokens on the system, and with any luck, there will be a domain admin available, and it will immediately elevate you to that level of privileges. It is literally push button ownage. Where you see this run very, very commonly are things like file servers, uh, or places where you know an admin may have been. Right? So similar to hashes, tokens are only available during the ac actual session. And so what you need to do is you need to find a system, like a server, a file server, where a lot of people have active sessions. Right? And you can go and just steal tokens all day long once you have admin rights on that system. Or the other really common vector here is our admins using RDP and not terminating their RDP sessions. They close the client without terminating the RDP, and their session stays on the remote system indefinitely. So if you can find one of those locations, you're good to go. And this is exactly what tools, if you're familiar with Bloodhound or Death Star, you know, some of these new uh, pen testing frameworks that basically go out and make a, a threat graph database of your environment looking for domain admin, they're taking advantage of those mistakes. All right, so this is just showing not only did we get to domain admin in this case, we also have the most powerful piece, which is a delegation token here, which means essentially now the entire environment uh, has been owned. So what Gandalf says, and your first key takeaway here is, we have got to pay attention to how our admins are admining the environment. If you're allowing domain admins to do things like RDP, that is incredibly dangerous. We have to move on. We have to retrain, frankly, our teams in order to basically take into account where they're putting their credentials. In the, in the current enterprise, these credentials are being sprayed everywhere. And it actually is relatively simple. If you're familiar with interactive and non-interactive sessions, the bottom line is if you are on an interactive session in Windows, your token is available very commonly. Unless you've done some mitigation, that token is going to be a delegate token. Uh, and things like your hashes and tickets are also available. So if we take, for instance, if we get rid of RDP and we do things through PowerShell remoting, all of a sudden we go to now not an interactive session and all of those elements uh, are taken away from the ability of the attackers to gather them and use them against us. 
So basically, we have to find new ways to admin our environments. Right? None of this is new information. It's just we have to retrain. Right? We have to teach. I think the security community is wake up, waking up to this, but I think our admin core are way behind in, in knowing kind of just um, how many mistakes they're making and, and how hard they're making our lives, frankly, uh, in the environment. All right. So boring, right? Tokens, hashes, you came for more than this. Uh, Kerberos, this is really what you're all running, right? So Kerberos is the future, Kerberos is the present, it's also the future. Kerberos was supposed to solve all these problems. It's a high-tech credentialing system, and I'm here to tell you, it actually just makes everything way worse. <laughs> Anytime you add complexity, of course, we add vulnerabilities, and uh, unfortunately, Kerberos is incredibly complex. And so the idea of Kerberos is we have these tickets, uh, you know, back in the days when Kerberos was, you know, created in the lab at MIT, uh, they were it was supposed to prevent things like these replay attacks. Uh, so you shouldn't be able to, like, officially pass the hash in a Kerberos environment or the equivalent because you shouldn't be able to just replay things like tickets. But it turns out in practice, you know, what really looked strong in the lab actually has to start being kind of lessened or weakened uh, when you get into a real enterprise. And so, for instance, remember, everything's tied to an account. If we actually required the domain controller to authenticate every single activity in the environment, every time an account was used, it would be impossible. And so what they did is they added on things like the fact that you get a ticket for something, maybe logging into a computer, and that ticket is valid for 10 hours. So now you can do things like pass the ticket attack, right? which is almost the exact analog of, of a pass the hash attack. And we'll talk about things like overpass the hash and golden tickets and silver tickets and all these other ridiculous uh, attacks and the different tools that, uh, that kind of allow this. And so I would say that Kerberos right now uh, is by far one of our biggest vulnerabilities in the enterprise. Um, you were seeing that just attackers, it's the world's largest dog pile, right? It's just one attack after another attack after another vulnerability identified. Uh, basically every other month, uh, we're seeing something just major blow giant holes uh, in this whole um, authentication mechanism. So here's an example of, uh, of tickets. So you can run a, a simple command on your command line for klist. It'll show you what tickets are currently available in memory. We can dump those tickets. We just dump them to a file. I can move those tickets anywhere I want. And then I can use a tool, of course, like Mimikatz to do what we call pass the ticket, which is essentially the same as pass the hash. And I can now authenticate anywhere in the environment using that ticket. And so this is us just moving a ticket someplace else, and now I magically become uh, whatever that user is allowed to do. All right, so the number of attacks in Kerberos that seriously would not fit on a slide. I picked out some of the, my favorites. Uh, pass the ticket, uh, overpass the hash. The idea of this is uh, maybe I only have a hash. Maybe you dump hashes, but there's some um, pass the hash mitigations in the environment, which hopefully some of you have in your environments. What can I do? Well, you can actually just turn a hash into a ticket using the overpass the hash attack. Uh, things like Kerberos thing. This is one of the more interesting attacks that come out in recent memory. Uh, Tim Medine kind of popularized this at DerbyCon a couple of years ago. Uh, this is, you know, mind-blowing. Right? If you are a domain user, amazingly, you can request a service ticket for uh, any service in the environment, any computer, any service, with no authentication necessary. Now, you can also ask for it in a very specific way, which basically is, is an encryption downgrade attack, so that the, re the answer you get back from the domain controller actually has a representation of the password in a hash. So I can basically just iterate through every computer, every service in the environment, grab all of these hashes, take them offline, crack them, and with any luck, I'll find some service account that has very high level of privileges, that hasn't been changed in the last five years, his domain admin, I can come back in the environment and I own it. And it's all offline. So it's not something that's easily logged or easily found. Incredibly um, easy and dangerous attack. And basically, you don't even need admin for it. You basically can be a standard user account and just start Kerber roasting the environment. You're almost all, certainly all familiar with the, the Willy Wonka golden ticket. I can create a ticket that lasts forever. Uh, it gives me unlimited privileges wherever I want in the environment. Uh, Lesser known, the silver ticket, I think this is equally dangerous. Now this is not an all access pass to every system in the environment. This is an all access pass to one system or one service. And so imagine you come onto a computer, you do your big dumping, you dump all the hashes. One of the hashes that you will get there is something called the computer account, which a lot of people totally ignore. 
Once you have the computer account, you can turn that into a silver ticket, which gives you uh, up to unlimited or domain admin access um, for that service or that system. Now what's really dangerous about these is think about your remediation plans. Very commonly, maybe an attacker has just been pivoting through the systems and we don't rebuild every system they've actually touched because that's just costly. If you don't do that and that computer account password does not get updated, that silver ticket could last forever. And we've seen attackers actually just going in and making sure, just turning off in the registry the update part so that computer account never gets updated. And I bet during your password reset, you're not resetting computer accounts. And so these silver tickets can persist even after remediation events, which is scary. And then finally, it just gets to the absurd. Uh, you can go to the domain control, you can patch LSAS, and you can basically create a backdoor for any account. Uh, you pick the password, you can use that account at your will. And the original password still works. The user has no idea this is happening. All right, so much more than that, but that's a, that's a good sampling of, uh, of some of the vulnerabilities we're seeing in, in Kerberos. And actually, I shouldn't say vulnerabilities. The reason why that these are um, so, so kind of evil is they're actually not vulnerabilities. They're features that are just being used in very, very evil ways. And this is uh, a problem for detection. As, as you see here, EU CERT saying, well, you know, we'd love to tell you that this is easy to detect, but bottom line, you can't detect it. Awesome. <laughs> it's good to know, right? Um, it's actually not true. Um, there are ways to detect some things, like this is specifically talking about golden tickets. Uh, it's just what they're really saying is that the average or even mature team is not going to have the ability to do this. And, and we'll see some examples here in a moment. Uh, things like Kerberos thing. Technically, you could start to detect this in event logs. Right, the idea here is it is an encryption downgrade attack uh, using the RC4 algorithm. So what you could do in a magical world, if you were actually logging 4769 events, which I bet most of you aren't, uh, you could go through all of those and look for a unusual encryption type of the ticket and maybe start to piece together you have weird activity in your environment. Right. Now the problem is 4769 events, you know, hundreds of these are generated per user, per system, per day. So most people turn these off. And even if you had them, the number of false positives you would get, uh, I've never seen an environment that actually uh, can do this realistically. Because you'd be surprised at how many random legacy uh, authentications you have going on in, in any enterprise. So technically, yes, but in real life, probably not. Um, same idea here. If you want to learn more about this, uh, Sean Metcalf has an amazing website, adsecurity.org. Uh, this is a, a must read. He's gone through. Uh, virtually all of the Kerberos attacks in gory detail uh, does a great job of showing things like this. Again, technically, we could go through and look for golden tickets in this way. Right, so you're looking for maybe a domain, but you see a blank in the event log. Right, or it should be domain, but you see a fully qualified domain name. Um, but I will tell you that if you have the level of granularity to do this, yeah, you are impressive. Right? <laughs> I've never again uh, seen anybody that can actually do that at scale. Again, so many false positives and getting through all the, the data sources. Uh, you know, literally, this is, my, I don't know if we've talked enough about machine learning this, this week, you know, but this is where we're going to have to have some AI. We're going to have to have something that can actually uh, do this for us because it's not really uh, possible for the human mind, in my uh, opinion. So, what I'd like you to take away today is don't go looking for, like, the tiniest needle in your haystack. Start small, right? So we can start with things like, you know, the obvious. Remember, we are dealing with authentications. It doesn't matter if someone authenticates with a stolen token or a golden ticket or some hash that they, they're passing. At the end of the day, they're using that to do something, right? So for instance, mapping shares, PS exec, very, very common with pass the hash attacks. So I don't need to be able to detect pass the hash, I can detect the actual results, right? So look for those type of activities. Schedule task. We see a lot of abuse with like pass the ticket being used to schedule task remotely. Right? So instead of trying to detect pass the ticket, which you're not going to detect, you can detect these weird schedule tasks. DSS admin for the, the theft of your ntds.dit file on your domain controller. It's a no-brainer. Right? It's, just, it's a, a super high fidelity alert if you see DSS admin activity on things like your domain controller. All of these tools, when you play with them, have kind of very specific signatures. A lot of the credential dumping tools actually create new services. 
So there are specific event logs, like event ID 7045. If you're familiar with that one, one of my favorites. High fidelity alert for a new service on a system. Uh, so it's a great way to catch some of the credential dumpers. Uh, Metasploit is a great example of like randomized file and host names. Right? You should be auditing like hosts that are authenticating in an environment that actually shouldn't exist in your environment. It's a great way to find things like uh, Metasploit type attacks. Um, and if you have some more advanced security kind of capabilities, so if you have like kernel level agents running, detecting code injection. So many of these attacks require code injection. And so if you have a way to detect that at scale, then you're way ahead of the game, you should be using that. And then finally, where I think we can get a lot of wins here is behavioral analysis. So things like that break glass local admin account. Why is it being used? Or why did this domain admin account actually authenticate to 24 different workstations in one day? Uh, is that normal? Probably not. Uh, or your service account, one of your biggest vulnerabilities. Why is a service account interactively logging into your servers? You know, if it's only a non-interactive account typically. Um, so lots of different ways uh, that we can kind of detect these anomalies. This is the epitome, in my opinion, of threat hunting. Going through your data sources and just looking for the obvious things. All right, that's certainly not going to solve all of our problems, but the, the good news is detecting this stuff is really, really, um, it doesn't require machine learning, I promise you. We, we can do this with a lot less. Right? The good news also, and a, another takeaway I want you guys to, to keep in mind here is that Microsoft has finally woken up to this just ridiculous problem that's going on. And so uh, XP, I think, was an unmitigated security disaster. Right? Windows 7 rolls along, and they finally start to implement some interesting mitigations. Uh, you're all familiar with user access control, I imagine. Um, not a security boundary, uh, but it at least stopped a little bit of privilege escalation, so it makes it a little harder, and it leaves more artifacts now when they have to kind of get through the UAC in order to get up to the, the admin uh, that they require to dump credentials. Uh, interesting enough, it, I think it was an unintended consequence, but it turns out that UAC also uh, blocks past the hash um, because of the, uh, it's a token issue. And so the fact that when you're authenticating over the network, uh, you can't get a high integrity token, and the pass the hash mitigation um, is nicely blocked uh, by UAC. So when you get to the Windows 7 environment, you should see a lot less pass the hash with local admin accounts. Uh, managed service accounts came out in the Windows 7 world. Now, service accounts are really one of your most uh, probably vulnerable uh, places. And managed service account, what this does is essentially allows you to use Active Directory to automatically rotate passwords on your service accounts and make them highly complex. Now, in Windows 7, this was a, a, a very, very difficult thing to get working correctly. We're gonna see we get an upgrade uh, in future versions of the OS, and probably most importantly in Windows 7 is that all these wonderful mitigations we're about to talk about in Windows 8 actually got pushed and backported back to Windows 7 uh, with this patch. And so. If, if you have not gone to this patch level on your Windows 7 systems, you're missing out. You need to get there. All right, so Windows 8 was really, uh, this is the world of Mimi Cats. And so this is when the sleeping giant of Microsoft finally woke him and said, uh, well, maybe we should actually do something about these ridiculous attacks like pulling clear text passwords out of memory. You know, or maybe we should try to finally mitigate things like pass the hash. And so we get things like uh, removal of the clear text, single sign-on passwords out of memory. So post Windows 8, we shouldn't be seeing those anymore. Uh, protected processes are trying to do things like LSAS, pr protecting it so it can't be injected into by any random process. Um, I have an asterisk next to it because it's not very effective. Probably the best thing about protected processes is you get additional logging. The, uh, the remote credential issues. So how do I protect my environment where I have admins already peeing everywhere? And so we get things like that restricted admin. So restricted admin, when you have, when you use that, your tickets, your hashes, uh, your credentials are not cached on those remote systems, right? So it's protecting, it's allowing you to, to actually do remote admin without putting your credentials at risk. So it's absolutely something that should be part of our, our admin's process. Uh, domain protected users group, probably the most important mitigation step in Windows 8. Uh, this is a special group that you can put your highly sensitive users in, and when they authenticate the systems, their hashes uh, cannot be used for NPLM so basically that breaks, completely breaks past the hash uh, for those accounts. Uh, the level of encryption cannot be downgraded on their tickets, so that breaks some of the techniques like overpass the hash, for instance. 
The uh, ticket length or, or lifespan is dropped from 10 hours to four hours, making you know, these a little harder to, to reuse. It doesn't cache credentials. Your tokens are not delegate tokens. By definition, they can't be changed. So it creates an extremely kind of uh, smaller attack surface for these accounts. You should absolutely be putting your sensitive users into that group. We get things like additional protections against uh, local account authentications. And so this is uh, directly aimed at, at trying to mitigate pass the hash. Uh, things like uh, restricted admin I mentioned, and, and again, that domain protected users groups to try to prevent that token theft problem. Um, and then finally, an upgrade to the managed service accounts. This one called group managed service accounts is actually realistic to get working. And uh, this is a fantastic way to get uh, some control over those very sensitive service accounts. Windows 10 comes along, doubles down. We get something called Credential Guard. This is now moving your tickets, your hashes, into essentially a hypervisor, right? So, or, or essentially into a virtual machine with an extremely locked down instruction set. Right? So this is a, uh, basically breaks all known credential dumping tools currently in play. Um, so um, it's not, a, it's, a, it's a very strong security boundary. I'm not gonna say that it's going to protect us against everything, but certainly it's, a, it's getting there. And so it's something we need to be looking for. Device guard is like application whitelisting. Uh, I think that's gonna be very difficult for environments to get working, but um, it also can pr protect against these credential dumping tools. And then we get an upgrade to restricted admin to now something called remote credential guard, which again allows you to do things like RDP through the environment without putting all your credentials at, at play. Um, and now it's not just admin, it can be any account uh, that can use this group. All right, so kind of wrapping things up, I'm not gonna go through uh, this in depth. Uh, this is really for when you go home and you start to noodle over some of this. But each one of the different attacks we talked about can be mitigated uh, through many of these different uh, new features within the, the Windows ecosystem. Um, and uh, who are my Mac users? In, 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 we have a few here, right? So I wanna make this simpler for you guys. So, it, it's, so instead of really getting too deep in the weeds for you, you know, things like protect tickets, protect hash, protect your domain admins, right? So uh, start here and then go back, back a slide and dig in a little deeper. Um, and so finally, how do we actually make some sense of this? What are the key things that I'd really like you to take away here? Bottom line is uh, that domain protected users group. That is a huge upgrade. If you can start to architect your environment and start putting your sensitive accounts in that group, uh, you greatly reduce the attack surface of those accounts, right? Those, atta those accounts uh, basically become almost useless to an attacker uh, once they're compromised. Um, planning for credential guard. So getting it, uh, if, if you're trying to justify upgrading in your environment, you know, getting to credential guard, getting to Windows 10 and Server 2016 and remote credential guard is a giant upgrade. This greatly reduces the ability to actually get those tickets, get those hashes. It's not going to protect everything. There's, there's still some token-based attacks that this won't protect against, uh, but it is a big upgrade. Um, getting a handle on your surface accounts. Even if you don't go to this level, which is this automated kind of rotation of all your surface accounts, the biggest takeaway from today could be just going and auditing what your surface accounts are. These are usually highly privileged accounts that everyone's afraid to change because you don't know what they'll break. Yeah. They're even hard sometimes to actually remediate when you need to do a full password reset. So get ahead of the game, audit those, and actually you get to the next step, put something in place to just automatically rotate them as well. And then finally, where I think everybody's headed, or where, I, to be honest, I think we're going to have to head to, to actually finally kind of get some control over our credentials, is, uh, is what Microsoft has been pounding for quite a while now, which is basically tiered admin, which is you have the ability to basically Restrict where your different accounts are. Have a level where only domain admins live, a level where only server admins live, and where only workstation admins live. And the three never cross paths, right? If your domain admins only ever log into the domain controllers, those credentials aren't anywhere else to compromise. So you literally, attacker cannot make the jump up to that domain controller without a direct assault against the direct domain controller. Right? This vastly, vastly improves the security posture of an environment. This is probably where we're all headed, whether you like it or not, and it's gonna require a pretty big architecture change.